Yes, I'm still here, Hollywood. And coming up on today's episode... I was good friends with Harry Nelson and still friendly with his wonderful wife, Una. And one day, he, he and I were out together having lunch. He said, we're going to have dinner with some friends tonight, me and Una. Do you want to join us? He said, sure. And we drive up to the, the Dakota. And I go, no, it can't be. Not those friends. Is this possible? <laughs> Open the, hello, come on in. Yoko, look. I know you, don't I? Dr. Victor Ehrlich on St. Elsewhere was the part that changed my life. Victor Ehrlich had one or two lines of the pilot, became one of the most popular characters on the show, was in all the episodes. I did very, very well. My plan was not so good. The plan the universe had for me was much better, and that's been the, the theme for my life. They had knives, didn't they? They did, yeah. We were stabbed. My friend Paul and I got stabbed. Career success in Hollywood is often measured in unusual ways. Some have Oscars and Emmys to show for their work. And some who have had career longevity have their arms, specifically when their credits are as long as their arm. Another small hint of making it in Hollywood is if you casually used to hang out with Marlon Brando. This is Still Here Hollywood. I'm Steve Kometko. Join me with today's guest and man with credits that are several arms long, best known for his role on the groundbreaking St. Elsewhere, Ed Begley Jr. Hi, Ed. Steve. Thanks for coming in to talk to us today. I, I love sitting down with uh, folks who have interesting lives, and you've certainly had a very interesting life. I'd like to, first of all, I'd like to ask you, your father was a, a well-known actor, won an Oscar, won a Tony. Uh, did he have much influence on your seeking out this profession? No question. I think if my dad had been a plumber, I'd be fitting pipe right now. Really? Yeah, I just wanted to do what he did, and and that's a big plus, being born at Begley's son. I feel like I won the lottery. I didn't even buy a ticket. It's just the good fortune of birth. But then the minus that comes with that, he made it look so easy. I thought, well, I can do that. Get me a wagon train. Get me a gun smoke. I want to be on The Defenders. Get me a TV show. Not just one episode. I want to be a regular like that. Like he could pick up the phone and do that, A, and B, if I... If I got that, would I appreciate it or, more importantly, know how to do it? I had no training, so consequently, I went up for a bunch of different parts, not that many, a half dozen from age 10 till about age 17, and didn't get any of them for good reason. You know, it's not the son of a plumber can't just go, I think you kind of fit the pipe together, you heat some of it up, I'm not sure, I'll figure it out on the truck. You know, it doesn't work like that, you have to train for something like that. And I finally started to get some small amount of training, and then I began to work. And looking back now, how have you enjoyed it? Or have you enjoyed it? I've loved every minute of it. I felt very lucky. I didn't, I didn't fully understand how lucky I was for a while. Early on, when I went to SAG for the first time with my first job on My Three Sons to sign up for SAG, I was going to have myself listed as James Begley because I didn't want to trade on my father's name and I didn't want to, and I'm different than him and I don't want people to compare me. And... I thought that way for a while, and I fortunately, after a few years, realized it's a big plus being Ed Begley's son. Number one, for any job interview you go for, in any line of work, they're going to A, remember your name. You know, Ed Begley, Rob Reiner, Liza Minnelli, they're going to remember your name. And two, of equal importance, they're going to have something to talk about. It's going to put them at ease, too. I worked with your dad on the Philco Playhouse. We had a great time together on the show. We did a, you know... Another couple of uh, radio shows back in the day. Good luck. Top of page eight, Eddie. We're rooting for you. You know, that's the way it would go. So it was a big plus being born a son, and I fortunately finally realized that and embraced it, and things got a lot easier. You've also worked with a lot of big names in your career. Meryl Streep. She Great Meryl them. Streep. Oh, boy. Oh, John Lennon. You knew John Lennon or met him or... Yeah. Encountered him a few times, met him a few times. I was good friends with Harry Nilsson and still friendly with his wonderful wife, Una. And one day, he, he and I were out together having lunch. He said, we're going to have dinner with some friends tonight, me and Una. Do you want to join us? I said, sure. And we drive up to the, the Dakota. And I go, no, it can't be. Not those friends. Is this possible? <laughs> Open the, hello, come on in. Yoko, look. I know you, don't I? He says to me, I can't imagine you remember one night at the Troubadour I met you, but good to see you again. Then after a while, we're talking, and he finally goes, 
Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, Yoko, it's a deaf mute for Mary Hartman. <laughs> they were fans of the show, and so they were like, How is, tell me about Louise Lasser and what's Norman Lear like and Mary Kay Place and all these questions. Like, they were fans. I'm just gonna, trying to keep my face from crystallizing and cracking and falling to the floor. You now I'm eating a beetle. Yeah. It was very exciting, but they were, they acted like normal folks. I mean, they're anything but normal. They're extraordinary artists, but uh, they just acted like and wanted to be treated like normal people. They had no help and evidence. She had cooked, Yoko made a macrobiotic dinner. We sat there and had it with Harry and Una. It was quite a treat, I'll tell you. I'll bet. And what about uh, Marlon Brando? I was friendly with him for years, and I realized after a time why I kept getting asked up there fairly regularly. I had figured out the ground rules, which were he didn't want to talk about acting, writing, directing, puppetry, claymation, trained seals, anything to do with show business. He didn't want to talk about, he didn't want to talk about, he did very much want to talk about, you know, drywall and plumbing and solar panels and wind turbines and green technology, all that kind of stuff. And so one day I got a call from Edward, it's Brandflakes, give me a shout. There's a project I want to do with you. It's about time we've been flirting with this for a while. I have the distribution, the great role for you in this. You and I will finally work together. Get up here as quick as you can. He called himself Brand Flakes? Brand Flakes, yeah. I was Ed the Bagel is Brand Flakes. <laughs> so he's got a project. He's got distribution, a role for me. He wants to get started right away. They've got financing. I go up there. I race up there. I normally ride my bike, but this day I take my electric car because I don't want him to give Sean Penn the part. So I race up there. comes out from the bedroom. Do you know how many volts an electric eel puts out? Did you? I had a rough guesstimate, a few hundred volts. I was kind of close, but he, and he said, uh, what's the name of the town down the coast? Marlon, you gotta help me, give me more than that. Down the coast, you mean like below Santa Monica, you know, Marina del Rey, San Pedro, Long Beach, Huntington Beach, Seal Beach, you know, looking at my watch. La Jolla, La Jolla, that's it. I'm gonna get 75 of them. I'm gonna put them in the pool and do you know what a placostomus is? A placostomus, yes I do, a friend had an aquarium, it's a sucker fish that eats the algae. Oh yeah, your pool is filled with algae. Are they a tasty fish? No, for God's sake, it's for the electric eel to have a food source. We're gonna, what are you gonna do with them? We're gonna run every house in America on electric eels. You're gonna what? He thought we were gonna run, I said, Marlon, you're not gonna be able to light a hobbyist light bulb at a science fair. It's just a quick zap for a second it doesn't last. It's high voltage, but not a lot of current. There's nothing, you know, Ohm's law, you know, it's not gonna amount to much. He just looked at me. Why is everything always no with you? <laughs> but that's why I kept getting asked up, because I would say no when it was no, but it was something wonderful and positive, like the deep ocean water cooling he and Dr. Craven worked on, technology that's used to this day, where you can heat a resort, keep the, not heat, cool in the very hot weather in a resort like Tahiti where he had an island. You know, you can keep the people, you know, the guests, the employees and the food cool without using a lot of electricity because electricity is super expensive there because there's no fossil fuels anywhere near the island. You gotta bring in diesel fuel and run a generator. So it's like 70 cents a kilowatt hour, it's very expensive. So, but if you can do most of the electrical work, which is cooling the food, the people, you know, the, the guests and the employees, save a lot of money and you can do that by t taking water that takes very little electricity to bring it up from uh, about 200 feet down, 300 feet down and do that cooling and return it sl only slightly warm. It's not hot water that's gonna hurt any fish or marine life. And it works and it's being used in the Pacific right now. Who knew? Who knew? You do, you knew. Uh, and and I'll, one more I'll, uh, I'd like to ask you about. It's Meryl Streep. What was it like working with Meryl Streep? That was fairly early on, She-Devil. Yeah, was that 88. was 1989. At that oh, point, I've been working. Gosh, I think I, yeah, I've been working 22 years at that point, believe it or not. Very lucky to get that job, and I knew it. And working with her, she's as good as it gets. She's the smartest, funniest, you know, most amazing person I've ever worked with. And uh, I just had a great time, and I've been an admirer before and after that film. She's just extraordinary. What she did early on in Sophie's Choice and French Lieutenant's Woman 
and Kramer versus Kramer and continues to do Iron Lady and all these wonderful films. She's Postcards from the Edge. I loved her in that. Amazing. amazing. I love that movie. Whenever it's on and I happen to be flipping through, I'll just stop and watch it. There's no one like her. She's just a, a force of nature. Yeah. Um, I also, when when people I've had I sat had a sit down interview with her once. Uh, otherwise, I just kind of met her on the red carpet lines, uh, and people always ask about her, and and I say, you know, you wouldn't believe she's got the best sense of humor. She's, she's a hysterical. hysterical. She's yes. so funny. Whenever you see her accepting an award, she's very funny. Yeah. I learned when I went through recovery three times, uh, I was taught uh, you're only as sick as your secrets. So I try to live by that. And my life is an open book, has become an open book. I used to be much more guarded. Um, you had issues with drugs and alcohol, mm -hmm. right? Big time. How did you get through it? Well, I kept trying to just tough it out and do it myself, and I could never do it. There's a saying, I can't but we can. And so it, with a group of people, you have a much better chance of getting well and staying well to have that group support. So I found that there's various 12-step programs out there for people who have problems with drugs, alcohol, other forms of addiction, gambling, philandering, whatever is causing you unhappiness in your life, you can, and danger in many cases. Mine it was certainly dangerous, not just, I wasn't just unhappy, I would put myself and others in great danger driving while intoxicated and high on drugs. So I finally got well in that important way back in the 70s. I stopped doing drugs and alcohol then, and what a difference. I wouldn't have been ready and able to do the movie with Meryl Streep, nor the show that preceded it by seven years, uh, St. Elsewhere. I just wouldn't have had those opportunities to do that kind of work or the work I'm doing today. I'm still working today. I'll be 75 years of age in just a few days. And Good for you. If you're still working in, you know, selling used cars or aluminum siding after 57 years in the business, you should count yourself lucky, and I do. I'm 71, and I'm happy for this job. Uh, and I'm glad I got through the drug and alcohol period, too. Um, I should tell everybody, he has a great uh, memoir, great autobiography. To the Temple of Tranquility and, and step, step on it. on it, yeah. <laughs> I like that. Um, you talked about gambling addition, addiction, too. Do you think you're just an addictive personality? No question. I'm very much an addictive personality. Now I have rather benign addictions. Chocolate is probably not going to kill you. So I have those kinds of modest addictions now and try to manage them well and, and seem to be doing it. But uh, I was really in big trouble back in the 70s you know, operating a vehicle under the influence of drugs and alcohol is a very dangerous proposition, not just for me, but I could have injured or killed a person, a family. You know, you're driving around a loaded weapon, basically, that has tremendous power and destruction, destructive properties. So I made it through that, and that's a, a mistake I don't want to repeat. Right. Uh, yeah, guilty as charged also. I'm glad I'm over that. What was, what, what memories do you have of Staying elsewhere. That, really, that, that put you really on the map, right? It did. Uh, Dr. Victor Ehrlich on St. Elsewhere was the part that changed my life, and Bruce Paltrow was the man that changed my life, along with Mark Tinker and John Macius and Josh Brand and John Falsey and Tom Fontana, the writers and producers from the beginning. Uh, you know, it was just a, a small part that I had. To be clear, I went in and interviewed for the part of Dr. Peter White, a regular on the show and didn't get it. They gave it to an actor I'd never heard of, Terrence Knox. Who's he and why would he get the part? I, was, I read very well and turned out I did because they threw me a bone, gave me another part, very small part, had a line or two. The part that I wanted and didn't get wound up getting killed midway through the second season, I think, shot in the, in the genitals and then in the stomach and killed because he was a hospital rapist, it turned out. Oh. That's the part I wanted. I didn't get that. I got the part of Victor Ehrlich, had one or two lines of the pilot, became one of the most popular characters on the show, was in all the episodes. So I, I did very, very well. My plan was not so good. The plan the universe had for me was much better. And that's been the, the theme for my life. What would you be doing if you weren't uh, an actor? I had other skills, 
modest skills. I was not anything like Harrison Ford or William H. Macy. I was a was and remain a bit of a carpenter. You know, I made a chest of drawers and a couple of tables and some things like that. I I can do certain things, but uh, I probably could have done that. I also wanted to be a cameraman. I worked as a camera assistant in the late 60s and early 70s, and I thought that's the way my career was going to go and was happy for it. I was not like, oh, this is a horrible second choice. It was great, and I was making more money than anybody at Valley College that I knew. I was doing very well. And then I got uh, summoned over to 20th Century Fox to do an episode or two of Room 222, a show that James L. Brooks had created. And uh, Gene Reynolds was a producer, and he was a friend of mine. And so I worked on that for a while, and that's where I kind of learned to be comfortable in front of the camera. And that was the beginning. But then, unfortunately, I spent the next... 15 years being comfortable in front of the camera. And that's not that interesting to watch. You see someone like Meryl Streep, a talent of that nature, they're comfortable when it's required to be comfortable, but otherwise you look at this character, Sophie, you go, what happened to this woman? Something happened, I want to know what it is. You know, what happened to Jake LaMotta in Raging Bull? This, you can see Bob De Niro's playing this character, has been through something big, and then we begin to learn what he's been through in his life that brought him to that opening scene in Raging Bull. And I began to work with people like Paul Schrader, you know, great writers and directors like that. I worked on a movie called Blue Collar and then Cat People and a few other things. And so, and I worked with Bob Rafelson on Stay Hungry. So I began to work with these people. Then Jack Nicholson on Going South. And it was Jack who was a friend for years, finally got me to another level of acting because I was at that point, as I said, comfortable in front of the camera. So every character I had was kind of a, I'm okay, you're okay, everything's groovy, kind of a 70s person or whatever I was. And uh, it wasn't very compelling to watch. Then I started to, at, under Jack's, you know, careful uh, instruction to show that there's something going on inside. What are you battling with? There's a guy named Roy London who put it quite succinctly one day and I finally got it. He said, you know what I think is the most interesting thing to watch? I said, what's that, Roy? He said, how a character deals with pain. I went, okay. Oh, look at that time. I got to run. Great session today, Roy. I'll talk to you later. I got out of the car. I thought, what a bunch of crap. I don't want to say, oh, I'm in pain all the time. Garcia Lorca's blood wetting and life is painful. And Oh, my God. And that sounds redundant. I went, wait. Hold on, that's not what he said at all. He said how a character deals with pain. How the character of Sophie and Sophie's choice is trying to keep the lid on the pot that wants to boil over from all that's happened to her. What was that choice? And then we learn what it was. And it's horrific. Mm -hmm. And so that's, Roy was right and Jack was right and all those people that began to incorporate in their work. You look at Jack's early work and he had some distance to go to in some of those early Corman movies. But he wound up being a, a great actor. He was there all along. He just had to tap into it to bring some of uh, his personal experience into it and do the kinds of things he did in Easy Rider and Five Easy Pieces and you know, eventually Chinatown and great movies like that. We'll be back in a moment. I'm going back to St. Elsewhere for just a second. Denzel Washington, you worked with him on oh that show. God, what an actor. I'm going back to St. Elsewhere for just a second. Denzel Washington, you worked with him on oh that my show. God, what an actor. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant actor. Many good stories. Yeah, we were, and I'm sure remain good friends. I don't see him much these days, but I would be very happy to run into him. He and I went skiing one day, and I, was, I just knew I was lucky to work with him and be on a set with him. He was clearly a very, very talented man at that point. We were all quite young. He's a little younger than me. I'm 74 now. When we started doing it, I was 32. He was about 30, I think. I think he's two years younger than me, maybe more. But clearly he had something like David Morris on that same show, something incredible going on that I hadn't fully tapped into yet. I was trying to tap into it, but hadn't really, you know, done the work necessary that they, they knew they had to do back then. And... Uh, and now I'm very proud of the kind of parts I get, the kind of people I work with, and the kind of roles I've been able to 
to own, you know, in some of the shows I've done in recent years, to be on Better Call Saul and Arrested Development and, you know, Young Sheldon and these wonderful shows. I just I feel very, very lucky. Six Feet Under. These are all fairly recent shows right. for me in my career. So the fact that I'm still getting that level of quality, you know, passed through my door in the form of scripts that are sent me. I just, uh, as I said, I won the lottery. Uh, I talked to Denzel. Uh, he was tapped to read the nominees for the Oscars the year he was nominated for um, Glory. Right. And, uh, you know, he was at the Academy and... He was very kind and came over and did our interview, even though it was like 5.30 in the morning. And uh, he, he was in the best mood. Um, and when the Oscars rolled around and he won, he, he came backstage and I interviewed him again then. And I said, why were you in such a good mood? He said, I just knew I was going to win. <laughs> I said, how did you know that? He said, I went and played basketball that morning and I was hitting everything, everything, everything. He said, I, I wasn't going to lose. There was no way. And he was just uh, so great about it. Um, and he, he knew too, and so did uh, the producer of that movie. I'll think of his name in a second. A very famous producer and a studio head, too, for a while. When that one tear comes down his eye, you know, as they're whipping him and what have you, that million-dollar tear. Yeah. And he's showing no emotion, stoic as his character was. It was just a... Uh, it was an amazing moment, and he, he always had that within him during St. Elsewhere, and he finally, he had a great role on St. Elsewhere, but he got to do truly great roles, you know, in uh, movies. And Bruce Paltrow was kind enough to let him out, schedule-wise, to have a little overlap where, you know, they, they needed him back for episodes of St. Elsewhere, or he sometimes I think might have had to leave a little bit early in the season. And when he got his AFI award, Denzel was so kind and thoughtful to thank Bruce for that because Bruce <clears throat> didn't have to do that. Denzel has a very talented son who's an actor as well. I work with him. He's uh, fantastic. You know, I went to see it. I can't remember the name of the movie. Uh, and John I didn't, David Washington is a great actor. Yes. I, was, I remember being, sit, sitting in the theater and listening to him, and the voice sounded so familiar because he does sound a lot like his dad. And... Uh, He's got a great career ahead of him, too, I think. I did a movie with him uh, called Amsterdam, and he was wonderful in that. And he did this movie. There's a two-hander, black-and-white movie they did during COVID where they're all kind of just, you know, quarantined in this house and shot a movie that everybody had been tested. It was a wonderful movie. I can't think of the name of it now, but with a woman who's a, a musician. She's a singer, a performer. She's fantastic. And she's in it. They're both so good. And Barry Levinson's son, I believe, wrote and directed it. It's a good movie, and I'm shame on me for not remembering it right now, but it's oh, wow. excellent. I would seek it out. Um, let me talk to you a little bit about the activism. When did you become an activist? I started. And in why did you become an activist? That's an easy one to answer. I started in 1970 because it was the first Earth Day. And why did I get involved? Because I grew up in L.A. You know, if you grew, grew up in Beirut or something, you might say, I'm going to work for the peace process in the Middle East, perhaps. If you grew up in L.A., you're going to go, I'm going to do something about this smog. About this brown air. Yeah, because I was born in 1949, so the 50s, 60s, 70s, horrible choking smog. You couldn't see from here down to Radford, the street that this building is on. And you, you couldn't see that distance, you know, some days of the year. You couldn't see the mountains 200 days a year, the hills, the Hollywood Hills right near us. You couldn't see there were hills up there. And so people would come to the to visit me in Van Nuys in the you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, and they go, why do they call it a valley? <laughs> then I quickly understood the question, because you, know, you couldn't see the mountains either side, the Simi Hills of Santa Monica Mountains or Verdugo Hills. There's no hills available to be seen because of the smog, and it wasn't just visual blight. It seared your lungs. It really hurt to breathe. And so after, you know, 20 years of that, when they said they're going to clean up the air with Earth Day, I went, sign me up. I was out here on vacation once in the 70s and uh, stopped to get gasoline. And um, the woman at the gas station, I, 
I said, I, I heard there were mountains out here. You, I didn't, I came, when I came back and the air was cleaner, I could see, and I was like, what? These were here the whole time? They didn't just move them in? Yeah, it was pretty bad back then. Um, also, I read about your um, encounter with some thugs that put you in the hospital. Oh, yes, 1972, that was. I was waiting for a bus, and this, in a way, is tied into my gambling addiction. I was going down to Gardena to play cards, and I knew that I could get down there by public transportation. I was big on that. But when I got to Western Imperial, the driver said, end of the line. I said, no, no, I'm going down to, I'm going down further on Western Avenue. He said, no, but you got to catch a Gardena bus system. It's a separate bus system, and that's why you can play poker there because it's not Los Angeles. It's a separate city. Okay, I waited. It was broad daylight, you know, two in the afternoon. I was with my friend Paul and waiting for the bus, and suddenly a crowd of kids came towards us with purpose, and we were just mowed down, and they didn't want money. I had money on me because I was going to gamble, but it was just uh, it was an unfortunate kind of an angry mob that uh, attacked us, but I I made it through it. I didn't perish, obviously, and didn't have any permanent permanent damage. I had a collapsed lung, and they they can fix that sort of thing. It's just more painful to fix back then. They would literally, while you're awake, carve this hole in your chest and put it in a tube. I don't know why they couldn't put you out, but they couldn't. I guess they had had to have your lung breathing Working, normally yeah. without a, any sedative to do that kind of work. But it was a very painful, emotionally and physically painful thing to undergo. They had knives, didn't they? They did, yeah. We were stabbed. My friend Paul and I got stabbed. And you still ride public transportation? I do. I know. You took it to the Oscars, didn't you? I One do. year? Yeah, I've taken it several times. I've taken the subway to the Oscars more than once. You have to get out at a different stop because the stop that you would normally get out is right in the middle of the red carpet. They have to close that stop so people aren't coming out confused or happy to be on the red carpet. So uh, how does a tuxedo go over on the subway? Oh, fine. People, you know, get it. Most people know that the Oscars are happening. So they go, wow, you're going to the Oscars on the subway? Let me take a picture. They're kind of fascinated by it. They think it's unusual. I suppose it is. I've ridden my bike to the Oscars a few times, too. That's another green way to get there. What are you working on now in terms of uh, environmental activities? I'm always trying to get uh, cleaner air for everybody. You know, we've, even though we have four times the cars and millions more people in L.A. from 1970, we have a fraction of the smog where I live and where most people live. But there's still some areas like the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles and near shipping centers, fulfillment centers. There's still a lot of pollution near freeway interchanges. So we want to get that air cleaned up for them as well. And that's a goal of mine. And uh, cleaning up the water is another goal. You know, we have these horrible oil spills that happen. We're trying to prevent those at every turn and get off fossil fuels as quickly as we can. It can't happen overnight, but it can happen over, most certainly can happen over time. And uh, by so doing, you know, make us more energy independent and and it's a cheap form of energy right now. Solar and wind has gotten very inexpensive, so it's good financially, too. It's good in every way you can imagine. And uh, as I said, even though we have four times uh, cars, millions more people, we have a fraction of the smog, so we've proven that we can do it. And that's something I'm involved in, continue to be involved in, with a Coalition for Clean Air and other fine groups like that, Union of Concerned Scientists, NRDC. They're all doing very good work with that. Did friends say, here comes Ed, put out your cigarettes? <laughs> they probably do. <laughs> um, you talked earlier about uh, the secret to acting was um, hiding, being able to hide your pain and uh, things of that nature. You're hiding something right now. Well, not hiding, but you have Parkinson's. I do. How do you deal with that? I didn't know I had it for a while. I was in very good shape as a man in my 50s and what have you. So in 2004, these things started happening to me physically. I didn't know what they were. I went, well, I'll just keep riding my bike up to Mulholland and around Franklin Canyon Lake and try to stay in shape. I guess I'm just getting older. But there's more than that happening. And finally, 2016, uh, I discovered that it was Parkinson's that was happening. 
and nowadays they can give you medication that keeps keeps you from shaking. This is a good example of the way things can be with Parkinson's in 2024 and certainly in 2016 when I got diagnosed. It's eight years later and it hasn't really gotten any worse. So I'm very lucky. I do everything that the neurologists say. Then also I do stuff for extra credit that my wife found that she has tried to get me to do to help. And she's had a very good success rate with it. Something called glutathione seems to help. Something called NAD seems to help. Uh, hyperbaric chamber, oxygen rich environment of the hyperbaric chamber seems to help. Vigorous exercise daily definitely helps. All those things that uh, some of them I was doing already kept it from the, the disease from even being noticed by me and some that my wife found over the years. You know, I'm doing very well for people who've had it 20 years. I'm, I'm doing, I'm head of the class in many cases. I can remember growing up and um, there was a woman in my father's church who had severe Parkinson's and she just, poor thing, couldn't, couldn't be still for anything. That was like in the 60s. Um, but you've had some contact with Michael J. Fox, haven't you? I have. He's doing wonderful work with it, wonderful funding, important research, you know, getting other people to help in and out of the medical profession. He's a great friend and a great leader. I just communicated with him about, you know, what needs to be done. So I'm standing by, ready to help whatever he thinks needs to be done because he's been, he's been dealing with it for a lot longer than me. Where did that quality come from where you want to help? Oh, that came from my dad now that I think about it. I had to think about it a second. And it, it relates to the smog of me getting involved in 1970. My dad died within a few days of the first Earth Day, and I got involved because of him, really. You know, he was he never used the word environmentalist, but he was one. We turn off the lights, turn off the water, we save string, we save tinfoil. He was a son of Irish immigrants. He lived through the Great Depression. And most importantly, when I would complain about the smog when he was still around, he'd say, Eddie, I know what you're against. I'm against the smog, too, but what are you for? What is your plan? What are you doing in a positive sense to make a difference? Otherwise, you're just complaining. So the ac activist part of me came from my dad because he was always interested in doing things rather than just bitching about it. And uh, I can thank him for that. It's a good, good trait, I think. Do you teach your own children that? Very much so. I don't think I needed to. I think it's the Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> they identify with their captors. and They've been <laughs> very green their whole lives. Uh, what would you tell your younger self? I would tell my younger self to just relax and to be in this moment, this one, here it comes, right now. I read that book, Alan Watts' book, This Is It, in the 70s, and I finally started to put it into practice when I got sober at the end of the 70s. And I realize right now, having just reminded myself that this is it, this moment right now with you seated in these chairs is is all there is, you know, you can live in the past, and that's fine, and project and plan for the future, but you don't want to spend too much time living in the past. You want to learn from your mistakes and, and live in the past in that way, but plan for the future, remember the past, but be in this moment again. Here it comes, this one right now. I have everything that I need if I let it be. That's one of my problems, living in the past. I think we all do that. Um, what do you think of Elon Musk and his, you know, con contributions to electric cars? Yeah, I was a big fan years ago and bought one of his cars, but uh, I think he's gotten a little off message in recent years. Yeah, it's just not, I don't agree with him on things I, I used to find quirky or even admirable is renegade status and what have you. I'm not sure it's being helpful at this point. There's some things that he involves himself in that I don't think are, are positive. I try to keep in the positive side of things. Finish this sentence. My life would have been better if... I'd read Alan Watts' book at a younger age. <laughs> well, I think it takes a certain amount of age and... It intelligence does. I too. was right on schedule. I didn't know it at the time. Okay. I still am. Do you have any advice for someone going through a hard time? 
you know, get help from your friends or a support group, whatever the problem is, or people that want to take their lives are going through so much pain. And there's support groups and helplines for that sort of thing. And there's certainly help for people who, you know, have trouble with drugs and alcohol and other addictions. There's different support groups for that. Reach out and, as you said so wisely earlier, you're only as sick as your secrets. You don't want to carry that stuff around. It's a burden you can't carry alone. You need help to, to carry it and eventually unload as much of it as, as one can. And it's a lot easier to carry with friends. Um, I'm going all over the place, forgive me. Uh, what about Howie Mandel, working with him on St. Elsewhere? My dear friend Howie Mandel was terrific in the show. He's a terrific friend. He had me on this podcast recently. I love Howie, I see him fairly regularly. Not as regularly as I'd like to. Uh, he and Terry are dear friends for years and I work with his daughter too. She was part of his wonderful podcast. Howie is a, a talented man and a dear friend and I love him dearly. And he's very funny. When you watch television these days, what do you watch? I watch, I watch the shows I'm in. I really like Young Sheldon. I really like Better Call Saul. There's a show called Stranger Things that I liked a lot. Uh, most people, of course, liked it. It was a big hit. And uh, I'm going to work with those fine folks, I think, soon. There's a project we've been in discussions about, but yeah, I'll talk about that more when and if that happens. But And we'll have you back. Sounds good. Okay. Um, who was your hero? My hero was at first my dad, and then my hero became this woman, Jeanette Pierre, that was uh, our caregiver, my sister and I, when my mother passed away when I was seven. We were unsupervised some of the time and it was, we were headed in the wrong direction. This woman, Jeanette Pierre, came around, came into our lives and we were there for some key years, age seven to age 12. And so those five years are very important for a young person. She was there. She was my hero. Now I have other great heroes. Uh, Jane Goodall is a dear friend and she's definitely my hero. Cesar Chavez was a hero and dear friend of mine as is Dolores Huerta who co-founded the United Farm Workers with, with Cesar Chavez. Those are some heroes in my life today. Ed, thanks very much for coming in. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks I was so looking much. forward to it for, for quite a while. Thank and you I'm, so much for having me. I'm glad we were able to work it in. Me too, buddy. Thanks. Still Here Hollywood is a production of the Still Here Network. All things technical run by Justin Zangerly. Theme music by Brian Sanishin. And executive producer is Jim Lichtenstein. <laughs>